I would love to warn the meat eaters it, it, from the bottom of my heart. All scriptures condemn mm. meat eating. It is an aberration and no meat eater will ascend. None of the alchemical processes can function properly to activate the individual so that he or she will be self-realized. Here is how Bhagavad Gita explains it. All meat eaters will reincarnate as the animals that they eat and will be slaughtered by the animals and eaten by the animals that they eat. Animal killers do not know that in the future the animal will have a body suitable to kill them. That is the law of nature. I'm going to start my, um, my ancient philosophical um, sharings with Ovid. Okay, and then uh, we're going to go to Leonardo da Vinci, Seneca, Porphyry, Plutarch, and many, many more of the great ones. Book 15, dealing with Pythagoras. Mortals, refrain from defiling your bodies with sinful feasting, for you have the fruits of the earth and the arbors, whose branches bow with their burden. For you, the grapes ripen. For you, the delicious greens are made tender by cooking. Milk is permitted to you too, and thyme-scented honey. Earth is abundantly wealthy and freely provides you her gentle sustenance, offered without any bloodshed. Some of the beasts do not eat flesh to allay their own hunger although not all of them, for horses, sheep and cattle feed upon grasses, but those untamable nature, Armenian tigers, furious lions, wolves and bears too, these creatures take pleasure in feasting on what they have slaughtered. What an indecency mingling entrails with entrails, fattening one on the flesh from another's, another one's body saving the life of one by another's destruction. Surrounded by all of this wealth, so freely prov provided by earth, the best of all mothers, you wholly ignore it, choosing to mangle sad flesh with your cruel teeth and delighted again to act out the rights of the Cyclops. Unable ever to placate your stomach's voracious desires until at last you have murdered another. That time long since past, which we now refer to as golden, was blessed in the fruit of its trees and in its wild herbs and in the absence of blood smeared on men's faces. In that time the birds flew through the air without danger. The fearless rabbit went wandering over the meadows, and the fish was not brought to the hook by its credulous nature. All lived without ambushes, none had to fear of deception, and peace was everywhere. But after that, bringer of trouble, whoever he was, who envied the lion his dinner, had crammed his greedy gut with the flesh from a body. Mm. He led us down the wrong path, for it may be that iron was first stained with the warm blood of the heart of the butchered. This would not have been a crime had the creatures attacked us, for I say that any such beasts may be rightfully murdered, but those that we must destroy should never be eaten. Crimes even greater emerged from that one. The sow is thought to have merited death as a ritual victim because she uprooted new crops with her snout, thus depriving farmers of hope for the year. The goat was led to the altar to pay with his life for the sin of devouring Bacchus. These two then died for offences that they had committed. But what did you ever do, sheep, to merit your murder? You who were born to serve man with milk from your udders, and with the soft wool underneath we make our garments, 
Your life is surely more useful to us than your death is. And what have you done, poor ox? So soulful and guileless, innocent, simpleton, born to bear our labours. Wholly unmindful, unworthy, the gift of the earth's fruits is one who, after releasing him from the weight of his of the harness, strikes down the worker with whom he has broken the hard field as many times as it had given him harvests, and chop with his axe at the neck worn by exertion. Is it enough that man has committed such misdeeds? The gods were charged with them too, were believed to take pleasure in dealing death out as the labour-bearing young bullock? Since that which makes him so pleasing is what will most harm him, a victim distinguished in figure and quite without blemish, his horns in bright ribbons is led to the altar, where he, without comprehending them, listens to prayers and observes the barley he helped to cultivate sprinkled between his horns, perhaps even sees in the basin, held under his head by the priest, the knife blade reflected a moment before his blood is pulled into the water. At once they tear out the guts from the still living creature and scrutinize them in search of some heavenly purpose. So great is the human hunger to eat what is forbidden. You mortals will dare even to feed upon this? Don't you do it. I beg you, pay close attention to my admonition. And when you devour the flesh of your fresh butchered cattle, taste it and know you are eating your labour's companion. A God is directing my speech. I will speak as inspired, revealing as though I were Delphi, the secrets of heaven disclosing mysteries known but to the illuminated. I will sing of great issues, never before now uncovered by earlier thinkers and hidden until the present. For it delights me to travel up into the heavens, delights me to leave the earth's insipid abode, and riding on clouds, mount to the capable shoulders of Atlas, where I can look down on those wandering mortals, lacking in reason, anxious and fearful of dying. And so, at the risk of repeating myself, I exhort you, lest your devotion be vanquished by the greed of your bellies. Stop this expulsion of slaughter of spirits like you. Embarked upon this great sea, have given full sails to the wind. Hear me out. Nothing endures in this world. The whole of it flows. And all is formed with a changing appearance. Even these passes, constant in motion, no different from a great river. For neither a river nor a transitory hour is able to stand still. But just as each wave is driven ahead by another, urged on from behind and urging the next wave before it is an unbroken sequence, so the times flee and at the same time they follow and always are new. For what has been, for what has just been, is no longer, and what has not been will presently come into being, and every moment's occupation is a renewal. How long shall we, we weary heaven with petitions for superfluous luxuries, as though we had not uh, at hand here wherewithal to feed ourselves? How long shall we fill our plains with huge cities? How long shall the people slave for us unnecessarily? How long shall countless numbers of ships from every sea bring us provisions for the consumption of a single month? An ox is satisfied with the pasture of an acre or two. One wood suffices for several elephants. Man alone supports himself 
by the pillage of the whole earth and sea. What? Has nature indeed given us so insatiable a stomach while she has given us such insignificant bodies? No, it is not the hunger of our stomachs, but insatiable covetousness which costs so much. In the simpler times, there was no need of so large a supernumeracy, supernumerary force of medical men, nor of so many surgical instruments, or of so many boxes of drugs. Health was simple, for a simple reason. Many dishes have induced many diseases. Note how vast a quantity of lives one stomach absorbs. Insatiable, unfathomable, gluttony searches every land and every sea. Some animals it persecutes with snares and traps, with hunting nets, with hooks, sparing no sort of toil to obtain them. There is no peace allowed to any species of being. No wonder that with so discordant diet, disease is ever varying. Count the cooks, you will no longer wonder at the innumerable number of human maladies. If these mm. maxims are true, the Pythagorean principles as to abstaining from flesh foster innocence. If ill-founded, they at least teach us frugality. And what loss have you in losing your cruelty? I merely deprive you of the food of lions and vultures. We shall recover our sound reason only if we shall separate ourselves from the herd. The very fact of the approbation of the multitude is a proof of the sound unsoundness of the opinion or practice. Let us ask what is best, not what is customary. Let us love temperance. Let us be just. Let us refrain from bloodshed. None is so near the gods as he who shows kindness. Learn what Plato, Plutarch, Porphyry, Marsilio Ficino and Leonardo da Vinci had to say about the reasons to choose a vegetarian diet. In the past, many philosophers adapted a vegetarian diet for diverse reasons. Platonists and later Neoplatonists, among others, were vegetarians and argued that not eating meat was a matter of ethics. If humans have the power to choose between animal sacrifice and vegetarianism, why choosing the one option that leads to the death and suffering of many, so many creatures instead of choosing not to kill? In Plato's ideal society described in The Republic, Plato argued that the upper classes should abstain from eating meat. Not only a vegetarian diet was the healthiest option, but growing plants also requires less land than producing animal food. A perfect example of a state based on justice, Plato's perfect place was idealized to help citizens grow spiritually, and a vegetarian diet seemed to be part of the plan. However, the concept of philosophical vegetarianism was better developed by Neoplatonists such as Plutarch and Porphyry. In the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci, Giordano Bruno and Marsilio Ficino also defended a vegetarian diet. In his essay on abstinence from animal food, Porphyry in the second century says that the concept of justice should be extended to animals as justice, in this case, means not to commit unnecessary murder. Most of meat eaters justify their choice by claiming that animals are irrational and therefore not subjected to the same moral rules. But Porphyry refutes this argument by saying that this is not a reasonable thinking as there are humans who also lack rationality and yet they are protected by moral rules against murdering solely for being human. Thus Porphyry says that it is not completely accurate to believe that animal, animals are irrational as they have memory, sense, fellow feeling and prudence. 
the fact that they cannot communicate properly their reasoning does not mean that they shouldn't be treated with justice. If a person comes from another country and speaks a different language, this person shouldn't be punished <clears throat> because others cannot stand understand what he or she says. Finally, Porphyry described Christians who denied the need of a vegetarian diet under the argument that animals are inferior and said that eating meat was not consistent with a philosophical life. Next subheading, on the eating of flesh by Plutarch. He wrote on eating of the flesh in which he argued that people are not naturally carnivorous but gluttony makes them cruel. As the desire to please the senses with the taste of flesh becomes more important than the life of other living creatures. Allowing animal slaughter unnecessarily only indicates that men are, become, are being dominated by their bodies. In accordance with the Platonic philosophy, Neoplatonists defended that the mind should be governed, should govern men's principles, as the use of intellect is one of the things that differentiate humans from animals, and when the bodily instincts take over, men are easily corrupted, so the only reason why people do not want to give up eating animals is because eating flesh pleases the senses. A true philosopher mm -hmm. must be above the senses and must not allow the instincts to overshadow the principles. During the Renaissance, yeah. after a long period of coma due to persecution of Inquisition, the Platonic philosophy, along, along with the Hermetic and Pyth Pythagorean teachings, re-emerged from the ashes and a new generation of philosophers started to defend a vegetarian diet as taught by Plato and Pythagoras. So this is Marsilio mm -hmm. Ficino. Mm -hmm. was one of the great thinkers who was a vegetarian. <clears throat> he argued that a vegetarian diet could hel help a person elevate consciousness and purify the body. He encouraged his followers to become vegetarians and abstain from anything that could enslave the senses, such as the kind of bodily pleasures that could dominate the mind. The great artist and thinker Leonardo da Vinci was also a vegetarian. In the letters exchanged with friends, he usually mentioned piety for animals. And it is said that he brought birds at the market only to set them free. <clears throat> As a good Neoplatonist, da Vinci assumed that killing animals just to satisf satisfy one's desires for flesh was absurd. It attests the human incapability of having control over the senses. Plato called this kind of behavior tyranny of the senses. When the intellect mm. learns that something is morally wrong, but the physical body ignores this principle in the name of its satisfaction. For a list of prominent vegetarian philosophers, read List of Vegetarian Thinkers. In the Republic, Plato describes an ideal state in which the guardian class should not eat meat under the argument that it was much more rational to choose a diet that would be less harmful to the environment than to the spirit. Platonic philosophy defended that the act of eating, like any other behaviour, should be done consciously. That is, people should have the power to choose between good and bad, morally right and morally wrong, harmful and harmless, instead of allowing the senses to de determine what they are going to eat. Plotinus, philosopher and founder of Neoplatonism, was a vegetarian. Theophastus, the successor of Aristotle, was vegetarian. Plutarch, Porphyry, Xenocrates, Ovid, the most famous pre-Socratic vegetarian was Pythagoras. Pythagoras put all his disciples under strict rules of conduct which included vegetarianism, celibacy and vows of silence. The reason to choose a vegetarian diet was based on the concept of transmigration of the soul or the doctrine of reincarnation. Pythagoras believed that animals would reincarnate as humans in future cycles of rebirth Therefore, they were worthy of respect. The Stoics were generally not vegetarian. However, two of the greatest Stoics in history did choose a vegetarian diet, Seneca 
the Roman philosopher and tutor of Nero, and Marcus Aurelius. Seneca said, but for the sake of some little mouthful of meat, we deprive a soul of the sun and light, and of that proportion of life and time it had been born into the world to enjoy. Let us ask what is best, not what is customary. Let us love temperance. Let us be just. Let us refrain from bloodshed. None is so near the gods as he who knows kindness. Renaissance philosophers and vegetarianism. During the Renaissance, the Platonic philosophy re-emerged and the ancient knowledge that had been forgotten during the Middle Ages started to spread amongst, among the prominent thinkers of that time. The philosophical vegetarianism taught by the ancient schools of thought as a way to reach the human ideal was resurrected in the Italian society. These great thinkers chose to follow the example of the Platonists, Marsilio Ficino, Giordano Bruno, the suffering imposed on animals, which does not seem to be the case. Since people have, can have a healthier life by adopting a vegetarian diet, here are some of the most prominent util utilitarians who defended vegetarianism. Peter Singer, contemporary Australian philosopher. Jerry Bentham, English philosopher. David Hume, Scottish philosopher. David Pearce. John Stuart Mill. Richard Wagner. Leo Tolstoy. Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, Schopenhauer uh, Albert Schweitzer. William Alcott. Albert Einstein. Voltaire, uh, Aristotle, Diogenes, Epicurus, Socrates, Gandhi, Nikola Tesla, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Isaac Newton, Francesco d'Assisi, Thomas Edison, the list goes on. Here is Sri Yukteswar, one of the greatest gurus of Vedic uh, wisdom in history. What is natural living? To understand what natural living is, it will be necessary to distinguish it from what is unnatural. Living depends on the selection of one, food, two, dwelling, and three, company. To live naturally, the lower animals can select these for themselves by the help of their instincts and the natural sentinels placed at the sentry entrances, the organs of sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. With men in general, however, these organs are so much perverted by unnatural living from very infancy that little reliance can be placed on their judgments. To understand, therefore, what our natural needs are, we ought to depend upon observation, experiment and reason. What is natural food for man? First, to select our natural food, our observation should be directed to the information of the organs that aid in digestion and nutrition the teeth and digestive canal, to the natural tendency of the organs of sense which guide animals to their food and to the nourishment of their young. By observation of the teeth we find that in carnivorous animals the incisors are little developed, but the canines are of striking length, smooth and pointed to seize the prey. The molars are also pointed. These points, however, do not meet but fit closely side by side to separate the muscular fibers. In the herbivorous animals, the incisors are strikingly developed. The canines are stunted, though occasionally developed into weapons as in elephants. The molars are broad topped and furnished with enamel on the sides only. In the frugivorous, all the teeth are of nearly the same height. The canines are little projected, conical and blunt, obviously not intended for seizing prey but for exertion of strength. The molars are broad topped and furnished at the top with enamel folds to prevent waste caused by their side motion but not pointed for chewing flesh. In omnivorous animals such as bears on the other hand the incisors resemble those of of the herbivorous. The canines are like those of the carnivorous and the molars are both pointed and broad-topped 
to serve a twofold purpose. Now if we observe the formation of the teeth in man, we find that they do not resemble those of the carnivorous, neither do they resemble the teeth of herbivorous or the omnivorous. They do resemble exactly those of the frugivorous animals. The reasonable inference, therefore, is that man is frugivorous or fruit-eating animal. And the asterisk there points down to the bottom. It says, fruit comprises any part of plant life useful to man. The fruitarian diet referred to by Swami Sri Yukteswar includes vegetables, nuts and grains. I would add seeds to that. By observation of the digestive canal, we find that the bowels of carnivorous animals are three to five times the length of their body, measuring from the mouth to the anus, and their stomach is almost spherical. The bowels of the herbivorous are 20 to 28 times the length of their body, and their stomach is more extended and of compound build. But the bowels of the frugivorous animals are 10 to 12 times the length of their body. Their stomach is somewhat broader than that of the carnivorous and has a continuation in the duodenum serving the purpose of a second stomach. This is exactly the formation we find in human beings. Though anatomy says that the human bowels are three to five times the length of man's body, making a mistake by measuring the body from the crown to the soles instead of from the mouth to the anus. Thus, we can again draw the inference that man is, in all probability, a forgivorous animal. Observation of the organs of sense now. By observation of the natural tendency of the organs of sense, the guideposts for determining what is nutritious by which all animals are directed to their food, we find that when the carnivorous animals find prey, they become so much delighted that his eyes begin to sparkle. He boldly seizes the prey and greedily laps the jetting blood. On the contrary, the herbivorous animal refuses even his natural food, leaving it untouched if it is sprinkled with a little blood. His senses of smell and sight lead him to select grasses and other herbs for his food, which he tastes with delight. Similarly, with the frugivorous animals, we find that their senses always direct them to the fruits of the trees and field. In men of all races, we find that their senses of smell, sound and sight never lead them to slaughter animals. On the contrary, they cannot even bear the sight of such killings. Slaughterhouses are always recommended to be removed far from the towns. Men often pass strict ordinances forbidding the uncovered transportation of flesh meats. Can flesh then be considered the natural food of man when both his eyes and nose are so much against it, unless deceived by flavours of spices, salt and sugar? On the other hand, how delightful do we find the fragrance of fruits? the very sight of which often makes the mouth water. It may also be noticed that various grains and roots possess an agreeable odour and taste, though faint, when, even when unprepared. Thus, again, we are led to infer from these observations that man was intended to be frugivorous animal. And so he quotes the Bible in Genesis 1.29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. By observation of the nourishment of the young, we find that milk is undoubtedly the food of the newborn babe. Abundant milk is not supplied in the breasts of the mother if she does not take fruits, grains and vegetables as her natural food. Hence, from these observations, the only conclusion that can reasonably be drawn is that various grains, fruits, roots are for beverage, milk and pure water openly exposed to air and sun are decidedly the best natural food for man. Cause of disease. These, being congenial to the system when taken according to the power of the digestive organs, well chewed and mixed with saliva, are always easily assimilated.
Other foods are unnatural to man and being uncongenial to the system are necessarily foreign to it. When they enter the, st the stomach, they are not properly assimilated. Mixed with the blood, they accumulate in the excretory and other organs not properly adapted to them. When they cannot find their way out, they subside in tissue crevices by the law of gravitation and being fermented produce diseases, mental and physical, and ultimately lead to premature death. Children's development. Uh, experiment also proves that the non-irritant diet natural to the vegetarian is almost without exception admirably suited to children's development, both physical and mental. Their minds, understanding, will, the principal faculties, temper and general disposition are also properly developed. Natural living calms passions. Subheading. We find that when extraordinary means such as excessive fasting, scourging and monastic confinement are resorted to for the purpose of suppressing the sexual passions, these means seldom produce the desired effect. Experiment shows, however, that man can easily overcome these passions, the arch enemy of morality, by natural living on a non-irritant diet above mm -hmm. referred to, thereby men gain the calmness of mind which every psychologist knows is the most favourable to mental activity and to clear understanding as well as to a judicial way of thinking. Alas for our savage inhumanity, it is a terrible thing to see the table of rich men decked out by those layers out of corpses. The butchers and cooks. A still more terrible sight is the same table after the feast. For the wasted relics are even more than the consumption. These victims then have given us their lives uselessly. As other times from mere niggardliness the host will grudge to distribute the dishes, and yet he grudge not to deprive innocent beings of their existence. Well, I have taken away the excuse of those who allege that they have the authority and sanction of nature. For that man is not by nature carnivorous is proved in the first place by the external frame of his body. Seeing that none of the animals designed for living on flesh has the human body, any resemblance. He has no curved beak, no sharp talons and claws, no pointed teeth, no intense power of stomach or heat of blood which might help him to masticate and digest the gross and tough flesh substance. On the contrary, by the smoothness of his teeth, the small capacity of his mouth, the softness of his tongue, and the sluggishness of his digestive apparatus, nature mm -hmm. sternly forbids him to feed on flesh. If in spite of all this you still affirm that you were to begin with, kill yourself what you wish to eat, but do it yourself with your own natural weapons, without the use of butcher's knife or axe or club. No as the wolves and lions and bears themselves slay all they feed on, so in like manner do you kill the cow or ox with a grip of your jaw, or the pig with your teeth, or the hair of a lamb by falling upon and rending them there and then. Having gone through all these preliminaries, then sit down to your repast. If, however, you wait until the, the living and intelligent existence be deprived of life, and if it would disgust you to have to rend out the heart and shed the lifeblood of your victim, why, I ask in the very face of nature, and in despite of her, do you feed on beings endowed with sentient life? But more than this, not even, after your victims have been killed, will you eat them just as they are from the slaughterhouse, you boil, roast and altogether metamorphose them by fire and condiments, you entirely alter and disguise the murdered animal by use of 10,000 sweet herbs and spices, that your natural taste may be deceived 
and be prepared to take the unnatural food. A proper and witty rebu rebuke was that of the Spartan who bought a fish and gave it to his cook to dress. When the latter asked for butter and olive oil and vinegar, he replied, Why, if I had all these things, should I have not brought the fish? To such a degree do we make luxuries of bloodshed that we call flesh a delicacy and forthwith require delicate sauces for this same flesh meat and mix together oil and wine and pickle and vinegar with all the spices of Syria and Arabia for all the world as though we were embalming a human corpse. After all these heterogeneous matters have been mixed and dissolved and in a manner corrupted, it is for the stomach forsooth to masticate and assimilate them if it can. And though this may be for a time accomplished, the natural sequence is a variety of diseases produced by imperfect digestion and repletion. Does it not shame you to mingle murder and blood with their beneficent fruits? Are the carnivora you can savage and ferocious? Uh, sorry, are the carnivora you call savage and ferocious, lions and tigers and serpents, while yourselves come behind them in no species of barbarity? And yet for them, murder is the only men's sustenance, whereas to you it is a superfluous luxury and crime. For in point of fact, we do not kill and eat lions and wolves, as we might do in self-defense. On the contrary, we leave them unmolested, and yet the innocent and the domesticated and helpless and unprovided with weapons of offense, these we hunt and kill whom nature seems to have brought into existence for their beauty and gracefulness. Nothing puts us out of countenance, not the charming beauty of their form, not the plaintive sweetness of their voice or cry, not their mental intelligence, not the purity of their diet, not the superiority of understanding. For the sake of a part of their flesh only, we deprive them of the glorious light of the sun of the life for which they were born. The plaintive cries they utter, we affect to take to be meaningless. Whereas in fact they are entreaties and supplications and prayers addressed to us by each which say, It is not the satisfaction of your real necessities we deprecate, but the wanton indulgence of your appetites. Kill to eat if you must or will, but do not slay me that you may feed luxuriously. Ill digestion is most to be feared after flesh eating, for it very soon clogs us and leaves ill mm. consequences behind it. It Definitely. would be best to accustom oneself to eat no flesh at all, for the earth affords plenty enough of things fit not only for nourishment but for delight and enjoyment, some of which you may eat without much preparation and others you may make pleasant by adding various other things. We can claim no great right over land animals which are nourished with the same food, inspire the same air, wash in and drink the same water that we do ourselves. And when they are slaughtered they make us ashamed of our work by their terrible cries. And then again, by living amongst us, they arrive at some degree of fami familiarity and intimacy with us. We, they make us ashamed of our work by their terrible cries. Being thus wicked and incontinent in inordinate desires, it is no less easy to be proved that men are more intemperate than other animals, even in those things which are necessary, e.g. in eating and drinking the pleasures of which we, the non-human races, always enjoy with some benefit to ourselves. But you, pursuing the pleasure of eating and drinking beyond the satisfaction of nature, are punished with many and lingering diseases, which, arising from the single fountain of superfluous 
gormandizing, fill your bodies with all manner of wind and vapors, not easy for purgation to expel. In the first place, all species of lower animals, according to their kind, feed upon one sort of food upon uh, which is proper to their natures, some upon grass, some upon roots, and others upon fruits. Neither do they rob the weaker of their nourishment, but man, such is his veracity, falls upon all to satisfy the pleasures of his appetite, tries all things, tastes all things, and as if he were yet to seek what is the most proper diet and most agreeable to his nature, among all animals is the only all-devourer. He makes use of flesh, not out of want and necessity, seeing that he has the liberty to make his choice of herbs and fruits, the plenty of which is inexhaustible, but out of luxury and being cloyed with necessaries, he seeks the impure and inconvenient diet purchased by the slaughter of living beings, <coughs> by this showing himself more cruel than the most savage of wild beasts. For blood, murder and flesh are proper to nourish the kite, the wolf and the serpent. To men, they are superfluous viands. A good man will take care of his horses and dogs, not only while they are young, but when old and past service. Thus, the people of Athens, when they had finished the temple of Hector Tom Tompedon, set at liberty the lower animals and that had been chiefly employed in that work, suffering them to pasture at large, free from any further service. We certainly ought not to treat living beings like shoes or household goods, which, when worn out with use, we throw away. And were it only to learn benevolence to humankind, we should be compassionate to other beings. For my own part, I would not sell even a little money, a man grown old in service, from his accustomed place for him, for to him, poor man, it would be as bad as banishment, since he could be of no more service, no more use to the buyer than he was to the seller. But Cato, as if we took, as if he took pride in these things, tells us that when consul, when consul, as if he took a pride in these things, tells us that when consul, he left his war horse in Spain to it's save the public the charge of his freight. Whether such things as these are instances of greatness or littleness of soul, let the, lead, let the reader judge for himself. 